I guess the first item of business is, um, well, in order to, I guess, remind you of the signature file, but also the next uh, item of business is to go into a non-public. And um, if someone could make a motion um, in accordance with RSA 91A colon three, Roman numeral two, A personnel. So moved. Okay, Zach moved, is there a second? Second. Okay, Ted seconds. Um, Mary, uh, any discussion? Seeing none, Mary, on your vote? <laughs> Aye. Um, Ted? Aye. Zach? Aye. And Neil will be on momentarily. He's uh, there now, so. Um, well, Bill, aye. So, um, aye. Marianne? Aye. Neil? Aye. Zach? Aye. Bill? Aye. Okay, we're out of non-public. Joke. All right, so we're, we're cooking now, right? Okay. So the next order of business is a discussion on um, a letter that we received from the Adjutant General um, in New Hampshire. Uh, it was um, General Michelides from the New Hampshire National Guard. And this is regarding um, the um, at least our belief that the uh, National Guard Armory, uh, once it's uh, no longer used as an armory, would uh, go back to the town of Plymouth. And this was um, actually uh, described to us in annual um, reports that we get called an agency real property report and it stipulated, oh, it has a listing of all the, the state owned properties in you know, the, the state's towns. And Plymouth um, included uh, the armory and the, the conditions read that um, when it no longer is used as an armory, it reverts to the town. And we tried to explain to um, Major General McLeodes that you know, we anticipate when they leave and go to their new facility out on, you know, the rotary, um, that the armory would uh, then be our property. And he took exception to that and wrote us a letter and um, in indicated that um, that statement was not in the deed. So he made a correction in the, in the, um, the, the agency real property report to not include that statement. Um, so um, we decided that, I mean, it's definitely worth our pursuit to make sure that we can find um, the information that made that statement um, appear uh, in the real property report. Um, and it could be something historic uh, because this was dating back to the, the 60s. And it may not have been language in the deed, but it is language nonetheless that appeared there. So um, we have a letter from our attorney um, to request a 91A request to find out when and where that statement appeared so that you know, we could reinstate that. And Kathy, you wanna make any further comment on that? Can, can the board get a copy of the letter he sent back to us? We haven't um, sent the letter Yet, right? Now we've got the letter. You've got a copy of Michelades's. Michelades. So, oh, you don't? Not in my packet. No. Yeah, I have Okay. All right. So there's some history that you probably um, would benefit from from receiving. Well, we, so last last meeting, we voted to to have you write a letter to him. Yep. Okay. And then, so we have at least that much context, but we I. I just haven't seen what his response said. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, it's, um, okay, fine. Then uh, we'll get you that letter. I could read it to you. Actually, I read that part. Um, 
Oh, he, you know, basically he stip- he observed that the fact that the deed only said that if the armory was not built in five years, um, then it would revert back to the town of Plymouth. Uh, since construction was completed within five years, condition placed on the conveyance in the deed was satisfied and there was no longer a requirement that the property revert to the town of Plymouth. The recorded source deed may be found in the Grafton uh, County Registry of Deeds at book 864, page 73. As we finalize our plans for a facility on Mayhew Turn- Turnpike, we will sh- sure to notify you as for a project. Okay, where was the actual statement then? That it was kind of a kicker that, um, uh, where's the, um, oh, no. As of today, we have not made any firm plans to divest the armory as our stationing plan for National Guard units matures. We will inform you of any potential divestiture of the armory. Um, Okay. He talks about the five years, Bill. I think that's the issue. Yeah, no, yeah he's, he just states it's the five year deal, but um, the, the we language. We is, met our obligation, so right. we don't yeah. owe you anything, basically. So, with regard to the agency real property reports you attached, we note that the language in the report is not consistent with the language on the property deed. We are correcting the report. So, you know, they're essentially wiping out the history of uh, the language that is actually in. The statement in the state's report to us on the agency real property report. So they do that <laughs> pretty easily. I guess you did it pretty easily, but really, um, and uh, it, it's a rather significant property for us, and we don't want it to, to go into the state mix or wherever you know it's anticipated that it would go. You know, once they move out, especially since the language in the report from the state was that it reverts back to the town of Plymouth. So, so we are requesting, uh, actually, I think we probably need a motion to request from um, the, our attorney. Well, we briefly you know, met with our attorney. He, he wrote a letter uh, met by phone. He, he wrote a letter requesting a 91A, you know, history of where that language occurred, or any mention of, of that that language, um, and we're need. Have you signed that or what? No, or, yeah, you, you wanted to bring it to the board. Today. All right. So th- therefore, we we need to um, have the board weigh in on that to make sure that um, we allow our attorney to uh, file a 91A request um, with the state to request any language um, regarding deed restrictions and any kind of language that may be outside of the deed as well. It would actually be us that's filing the 91A request. Oh, okay. Yeah. Where is the letter? So those aren't something we would have? Those aren't, we don't have any documents that pertain to this? We have a lot of documents, but what the original deed says is exactly what he said, that Way back when, in 1955, the town voted to put away money into a capital reserve account to buy, to purchase a piece of land that they could build an armory on. So the town bought the land and then turned it over to the armory. And in the deed, it says the armory has five years. They have National Guard has five years to build on that land. And if they don't, it comes back to us. So they did build within the five years, but... These recent, these reports that we're finding from the state say that when it ceases to be used as an armory, it comes back to us. So it's still saying that we get it, you know, but he's disputing that. He's based, he's going on what the deed said in 1955. So I'm wondering if there's something else out there or why the state would have put in their, in in their records that it was going to revert to us once they don't use it anymore as an armory. And it's a fairly common practice for uh, state-owned property to revert back to the town too. So, I mean, it's not really exceptional that of what we're requesting, especially when the language has been carried forward for years. So, but- um, Do we have any, do we have any planning board records? No, there wouldn't. No. There wouldn't be planning board records. I mean, we theoretically we could have some documentation that be kicking around that we haven't I discovered yet. Or... I have a question. Do, do you know who the grantor was back in 1955? The grantor to the town of Plymouth? Yeah, uh, Fred. He was Toby? actually a selectman at that time. Toby? 
Yes. Yes. Well, it was wasn't he a state senator? I don't know. He was a selectman at the time because he signed off on the property hmm. transferring, which would I would think would be a conflict of interest. Whatever. <laughs> but, We're not well, investigating that. that. That's right. <laughs> But that was that was years ago. So there, there could have been some discussion at the state level that is in records, uh, such as legislative intent. Probably which, so. Which was guiding this. So that should be investigated. Yep. Um, well that is somewhat covered or it is covered in the letter that um, attorney Radigan um, drafted for us. I could read you that. You don't have a copy of that either. I, I take it, but um, this yeah, is, we have that. Oh, you have that. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's so it, the town of Plymouth requests to inspect and copy all government governmental records that relate to or reference in any way, any sort of condition restriction or understanding whether, you know, so, I mean, it's beyond Michelades. It's um, it's the state. So, you know, theoretically, that would be discovered. You know, the any kind of um, discussion or legislative intent or grant of the property outside of the uh, you know the deed. So, I mean. I mean, nothing that's, would stop us from doing our own research as well, but um, and we've got time. You know, it's not it's not like we have to do this like really quickly. But this would be a good you know step to at least involve uh, Michelades in doing a discovery himself. So, since you've had a chance to review the letter, um, are there any comments on that specifically, or? And if not, if you want us to go ahead, is there a motion? So moved. Okay. To um, have Kathy sign this letter on behalf of the town of Plymouth to uh, Michelades. Put words in your mouth, but um, all right. That this was for um, to allow the town attorney to pursue the RSA 91A request. No, it's us. Okay, it's so us. not the town attorney. He wrote the letter on our behalf. But it, he said it should come from us. But he would pursue it if we don't get what we're looking for. Okay. Okay. So, so Neil Neil moved. Is there a second? Second. Ted seconded. Um, any discussion? Any further discussion? Okay. Seeing none. Um, Zach, your vote. Mary Ann? Aye. Ted? Aye. Neil? Aye. Bill? Aye. Okay. Um, since I don't have to do an item on Sununu's decision not to vaccinate college students, because we now have that not in effect, but uh, targeted what, for April 19th. Yep. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I must have done a really good job. Yep. I don't have to do it anymore. So. Will they have time to get their second shot? It doesn't really matter. Yeah. Well, okay. uh, hopefully they, you know, hopefully they will, but they're. Aren't they trying to get Johnson and Johnson? If. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, you know, like J and J's got the recall. Um, you know what? Else? I mean, it seems like there's, there's you know a couple of different vaccines are somewhat problematic. Actually, Scott Whedon can uh, weigh in as well. But um, if they have J and J, I'm thinking that's that'd be great. If they don't, that's still fine. You know, they're going to be, you know, mostly immunized. Um, they can get their second one at home anyhow. Yeah, either that or <laughs> yeah, but they can get it get it. Um, yeah, exactly. Get it when they go home. If home is not Plymouth or what's going Hampshire. on on April nineteenth? That's when they're allowed to start getting their shots. Yeah, and it's, and actually, Scott, you can weigh in if you want, but it's like sixteen and older at that point, right? That is correct. So everything is open for sixteen and over right now. 
on April 19th. Um, it opens for the out-of-state college students, as you mentioned, Bill. I know in a call last week, um, they're trying to do closed pods and do the J and J so that um, it's one and done and they move them forward. And when they go back out of state, they'll be fully immunized as well. So there's hopefully that uh, more J and J coming into the state over the next two weeks of which will hopefully be used for those closed pods in the universities. So who'll be doing the administration and then the effect on Steve's group as far as long lines? For the closed pods? Or yeah, for who's going to be administrating the shots for the students? Well, what they're trying to do right now is through the um, ANGEL um, with the New Hampshire Public Health Network in our area is to organize that through uh, Angel and get those set up. And she has a list of vaccinators that she uses as they did at SAU 48 on March 10th and April 10th. Gotcha. So it's likely it will be on, on campus for at least for the students at PSU or? That's what they're pushing for, Bill. Okay. All right. And um, well, Oh, actually, so ugh, we didn't do anything on budget sharing or what was the deal on budget share or shared revenue? Where we stand? Yeah, you, you wrote that in your email when we were going to talk about his decision not to vaccinate college students. All right. Well, that that budget's still creeping down, so I don't know what the re resolution is going to be. So let's bypass that, okay? And maybe we can just stick with Scott um, because... Um, you know, Marianne, you brought up um, that issue about like long, you know, really long lines at at least the armory. Mm. Um, I thankfully I never experienced that. I, well, the two shots that I had, I was pretty damn lucky, I guess. But um, I'll let you know tomorrow, <laughs> Mr. Chair. Time. Yes. Uh, so you know, uh, I just wrote an email last week uh, to the National Guard, Homeland Security. Uh, and, uh, I did CC, uh, Scott on that email, uh, last Wednesday, uh, was literally out of control. Um, they can comfortably do about 400 vaccinations a day. And they, uh, last Wednesday did 1,080 and the traffic was wrapped all the way around the armory, armory road through two parking lots of PSU down armory road, down Toby road, down weeks road, down Merrill street, down main street, all the way back to Kirk's. Uh, auto, and then all the way to the traffic circle, the other side. So we had to I, literally, I had to take all my people who were on duty and, and have them come out and help with traffic. And I had to add uh, additional uh, resources to that detail to just to accommodate the uh, heavy flow of traffic. And it's just not that site is way too small for that kind of volume. Okay. See, who controls kind of how many people can come through in a day? I honestly don't have the answer to that question. I don't know. And I don't know that they have the answer to that question. You know, I mean, depends on who you ask, you get different answers about things. It's a little frustrating to be honest with you. Um, you know, and, and, um, uh, you know, some people like they're overbooking other people, are like people didn't have appointments, but they had an appointment written on the back of their card and unbeknownst to them, they were supposed to schedule an appointment online, but they didn't do that. So they were still honoring it with the car. It was, so many things. I'm like, okay, I, I can't deal with that. I just need to deal with the traffic before we have another accident. Cause a few weeks prior to that, we did have accidents because it was backed up almost all the way to the interstate. So speaking of, of the fact, yeah, so my car, it only had someone, you know, the, the national guard guy just wrote it in the back, mm -hmm. you know, the date and the time. And then I tried to, to verify that. And there's, you know, back in the day, it was before Vinny and it was after Vans. So there was no place to check. Yeah. So, uh, and you know, yeah, the frust frustrating part is, you know, I, and I'm not, I'm not poo pooing anything by any means, but I'm just, just tell us from what I've heard working at those details, the VAMS was very easy for like the national guards, people to check people in, but very hard for the average person to get an appointment. And then fast forward to Vinny and it's very easy for the average person to schedule an appointment. Very hard. It's harder for the national guards, people to check people in with that system. Yeah. Okay. So, I, you know, I, I don't know. It's just, 
I mean, they're doing the best they can. And I, to be honest with you, I feel really bad for half of them. Um, they are working really hard and they worked really hard to, uh, you know, keep the traffic flowing that day too. Yeah. I gotta <laughs> say, I got mine too at five. I expect, I was expecting two hours. We were probably in line, maybe 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, it was impressive. Actually. I was impressed. We got through so quickly. I gotta say that, um, Scott, Kathy gave me my shot. And he stuck it right in the bone. He had to put his foot up on my arm to pull it out. Oh, it my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but hey, it was pretty interesting that uh, he gave me the shot. So. <laughs> my second shot, boy. What's that? My second shot, it really hit me hard. Oh, yeah. It does. It took a couple well, of weeks. I, I lucked out, I guess. But anyway. I do too. <laughs> okay, what, are you getting uh, which one? Moderna. Okay. Well, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> I know a girl in Vermont that had it and she had a high fever for like three days. She wasn't feeling good. I'm like, great. <laughs> we have a vaccine call on Wednesday at noontime. So we can check further into that, Steve, to see if they've come up with any type of solution for the Plymouth Armory. You, you can ask. I know what the answer is going to be, but please feel free to ask. Uh, you know, they even reached back out to me and said, hey, you know, um, is there a spot in Plymouth? And like, hey, no, there's not. We've already explored this, guys. You know, we, we, uh, we went, I went around the town with a couple of majors and we picked a few spots, but they're just not good enough. You know, and, and the, the, you know, the Plymouth Armory is what we have. But the, the problem with that is, like I said, about 400 vaccinations tops. That's a that's a comfortable day for them without impeding any of the Plymouth traffic. I know on the call last Wednesday, they talked that hopefully the fixed sites would be going away after the next few weeks. And they would open up Hannaford's, Walmart, Walgreens, CVS would start administering the COVID-19 vaccine. But a specific date that hasn't been given yet. Well, so Scott, anything? Um, well, actually, you're going to be speaking about the uh, COVID 19 illness policy and the mandatory daily screening certification form. Um, any, any other discussion on, on that, or we're pretty much. All right, Scott, you want to do the um, policy changes? Sure. So the policy was updated based on our conversation we had on March 22nd at the uh, work session. Um, the current policy that was updated on March 26th, I think, that you have in front of you tonight, does follow emergency order number 88, which um, talks about the universal guidelines for travel it also includes the DHHS updates from March 16th, and that's specific to Section 5 on the COVID illness policy. So those are the updates we talked about that night. And then with regards to the screening form, it was updated um, as needed um, with regards to the policy. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, any questions or discussion on that, or thanks, Scott. You're welcome. And um, you know, regarding uh, contacting state reps, and this is in reference to a couple of uh, correspondences that were, um, you know, written to you know inform reps about support or not of certain bills, and I don't know if. Anyone's had a chance to uh, provide uh, testimony or at least, um, you know, the, your support or, or lack of support for specific bills, but um, you're kind of tempted to put in. I mean, it's very easy now to go into the legislature um, and just go ahead and say yay or nay on, you know, whether you support a bill or not. Um, it's very simple and easy just to put you, your name in as like Bill Bolton, select board chair. Well, yeah, you, you might, may, might be, but you don't make comments on behalf of the town um, specifically to, you know, legislative pieces or contact your legislators um, and act on behalf of the town. You're a private citizen at that point. Um, 
unless the board takes a stand on a specific piece of legislation that would like to, you know, have someone reach out to um, like a public hearing um, and indicate that the Plymouth Select Board is against or for this, this piece of legislation. So, you know, it's just something to keep in mind because it is very easy now to, to go into, um, you know, general court and just um, sign on to a bill and say you support or you don't. Um, just remember that you're just doing that as a private citizen um, to include our town manager. Um, unless the board suggests that she, she goes out and supports her or doesn't support bills. And we have a lot of um, agencies and uh, different support groups that act on, on our behalf, um, like New Hampshire uh, Municipal Association or you know, different associations are already doing that, they're lobbying. So um, just a reminder that you, know, you, you do not act on behalf of the town um, you're just a citizen, not just a citizen, but you're a citizen. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. Um, anything else that someone would like to bring up or? So I did uh, get approached by a couple, uh, I don't know if you just have free time to fill or not. Um, go for it. <laughs> so one of the things was um, the trees on the town common. I know we don't have an official town tree kind of person, but who normally has been taking care of that? And can we, Kathy, you've been taking care of that? No, I'm the tree warden as I town see. manager. Yeah. Oh, talk to me. I didn't tree know warden. that. I didn't know. Well, Paul, Paul, when he was town administrator, found a paper that said the town administrator is the tree warden. It's like, uh, oh, good, thanks. <laughs> but so what about the trees on the common? So are they, they had are concern. They <laughs> Say that again. Are they, are they misbehaving? <laughs> or do they need the warden to? No, they felt they weren't being pruned um, well enough. Um, yeah, they were just wondering who takes care of the trees. Parks um, and Rec. Parks, Parks and Rec. Rec. Take, yeah. Okay. So, right, so well, Doug McLean has a personal interest in some of those trees, yes. so it might might be a Doug a Doug you know issue as well. He said he would show Parks and Rec how to prune them properly. Okay. Did you catch that? <laughs> I did. So I initiate that conversation with Doug McLean, or what do we do? How do I do? We'll talk to Larry first. Yeah. He's responsible for the park. So we'll talk to him and let him know that Doug McLean has an interest in it. Okay. Um, and then they can get together. Okay, great. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Doug donated some of those trees. He right. did. Yep. Yeah. Amer well, the, not the uh, American Elm. Amer what was the? Chestnut. What? Chestnut tree. No, no chestnuts. No, the elms there. They're, they're, no. they're resistant to the yeah. elm disease. Yeah. Um, Patriot, yeah, whatever they are, they're elms, <laughs> and the chestnuts uh, are not going to go on the town common because they have an issue with dropping spiky seed pods that kids step on oh. playing around. Well, they leave their Legos around, so <laughs> <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> and then the other concern is seeding on the common. There aren't there aren't many places for them to. Uh, I mean, you know. So I don't know. We have one bench and one picnic table, I think. I well, know. You know, you could ask your your um your fellow business people on Main Street if they want to put a table on the common and have their name like put on it that they donated it or whatever. You know, call it an M and M scoops picnic table. I see, right, right. Let me see if I can rustle something up. And probably include uh, Larry again too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's his, the comments his. So. Okay. It's just a thought. Yeah. No, it's not somewhere. Commons getting more use now. I yeah. Notice there's like straw out there, so they must have seeded or something. Um, yeah. And no longer applying chemicals. So. 
Right. Looks okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any uh, anyone else has something to? Well, I, I'll, I'll kick off a uh, discussion. Um, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Neil. Uh, the airplane that's upside down at the airport. Yeah, what, what's going on there anyway? Well, um, I've I talked with my son, Colin, and he, he really wants to get rid of it, but he's afraid to touch it because the owner doesn't communicate and he doesn't want liability. And I guess he's talked with the Aeronautics Commission about it, but I don't know where it's going, but it's still there. Did it blow over in a uh, high wind? Yeah, we had a 41 mile per hour gust and it uh, broke the uh, uh, tie downs, which had been neglected. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Colin but, said it's been there for how many years? 20? Yeah, the, the, wow. the guy, I don't know much about the guy. I, I Colin said he lives up in the woods and he's off offline and everything, and he's difficult to communicate with. He lives over in Groton. It's been there 20 years? Is that what well, you said? Not upside down. Well, no, not upside yeah, down. Oh, plan. all right. <laughs> it, it's not airworthy. Yeah. Well, especially now. <laughs> no. It's really badly damaged now. So Wouldn't that be like abandoned property or something? I don't know. You have to, I guess you need to ask Colin, you know, where it stands. I know he really would like to get it out of there. I think what we should do is um, have a good discussion with Colin, see what's going on, yep. and then see if we can maybe have the Groton Police Department see if they can reach out to this gentleman if we can't. I mean, must get Colin mail. is going to send him a letter and tell him that he wanted to do something with the plane, but he didn't want to touch it with the, this guy signing a waiver. So I haven't heard anything from Colin since then. Okay. Neil, is it leaking? Yeah, I don't think so. Well, there must've it, been some fluid. It's just a it. distraction. If it's been sitting for 20 years and not probably mm. empty. And, probably and it could empty. blow again, you know, it's not tied down. You know, another big gust of wind comes along, could be out in the road. Okay. Well, as long as it blows it over the bank, I guess we'll be all set. So. <laughs> yeah, over to my place. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Anne's, Anne's going to take care of it. Anything else? So I did have a discussion um, with one of the board members regarding, um, I guess, the, the concern about a uh, presentation that was made to defend a budget item um, and the fact that, you know, there could have been a better discussion prior to the presentation to, you know, have that person ace it. Um, so I, I, and that brought up the fact that um, not everyone is either expected to um, do things in a similar manner to guarantee success. So, you know, there there was a, a, a discussion about whether or not we might be able to do um, something like an annual, um, you know, review of uh, an employee's, per, you know, performance, um, you know, over the past year. I know we brought this up a couple of times and it was really kind of like uh, like negated um, a few years ago. And um, the previous town administrator had a real issue with it as well. Um, but um, it, it could, it, actually it would be very beneficial to have this um, opportunity to let people know um, their expectations and, and how best to meet that over the next year. Um, so I, I just putting it out there, whether or not people might think that that's a benefit that we might want to work towards to at least do the supervisors of, um, you know, our, our different units to make sure that, you know, that's 
passed along, you know, during at least a singular annual review? Uh, what, what do people think? I personally think that having a annual review for especially supervisors or managers of departments in this case uh, is a good thing because it can provide goals and constructive feedback that is documented and allows them to improve. My concern about not having it right now is that they are operating under the assumption that they're doing okay until someone tells them differently. If they're not getting that regular feedback in goal setting, then there's really nothing to measure them against. In, in that, I would, I would even go to biannual. Uh, a yearly um, seems like a long time to let somebody... I'm, I'm assuming people are having conversations along the way um, you know, more, whether it's weekly or monthly, um, you know, how are you doing with these various goals? It's important, like Ted said, you know, um, give them feedback. Um, but in, those aren't so formal. So I'd love to see it be biannual and, uh, much more formal, you know, written down and things like that. You know, how are you doing in the first six months of your goal setting? Okay. Thanks, Marianne. Mr. Chair, yes, Steve. Being one of the supervisors and department heads, none of you guys know what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, so I really don't think that's fair for you to evaluate me on a on a daily basis like that. Um, you know, we at the PD, we do uh, you know biannual um, evaluations on everybody, and to be fair to everybody, I actually have the deputy chief do mine because he does know what I do on a daily basis, and everybody that you know. Um, anybody on the board is available to uh, look at any of those evaluations anytime they want. They're in everybody's personnel files. Uh, I can't, I can only speak for the police department. I'm not speaking for uh, any of the departments, but that's what we do at the police department. Um, and if you wanted to evaluate me, maybe on a limited scope, like, um, I don't know, uh, like public hearings or, you know, dealing with you guys, uh, preparing budgets, uh, those kind of things I would greatly, uh, or encourage that type of feedback from you guys. But like I said, yeah, on I a day -to -day that, cause that's going to be a gap for you, right? Cause he's not going to be able to evaluate you on, on those components. Of your Correct. Job. Yeah, absolutely. Cannot. So, I mean, if you guys want to do that, that would absolutely be fair. And I would, I would love that feedback to be honest with you. Well, this would fall to Kathy, right? Or, yeah. or Kathy, or, whatever. Or, cause like Steve and uh, the police chief, they don't, do they report to Kathy or do they report to us officially? According to the good book, they report to Kathy. At least that's my understanding. Well, I always, I mean, I report to Kathy anyway, because, um, you know, no offense to you guys, but you're available only on a, a, every other week. So I, I have yeah. to report to her, you know, in order to uh, get things done. We make policy. Mm -hmm. And she's the administration. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, we should do this. I can think of other departments where it, you know, we really need to get up to speed. Thanks, Neil. Um, Scott, you have your hand up. Uh, I was just going to, at, at Health Trust, and I know it's not exactly the same, but we do have an annual evaluation process and supervisors and managers have to have quarterly check-ins with each one of their staff. And they build the documentation, good, bad, or indifferent, and make sure that they are following their goal setting process. So it's done quarterly, there's an annual review, and before the annual review kicks off, there's a self-evaluation that the employee fills out, or the supervisor fills out in my case, I would fill one out, it gets sent to Wendy Parker, she reviews my self-evaluation, she reviews the quarterly notes that have been taken from our check-ins, as well as my goal process on the goals and objectives that were set during the evaluation process. It seems to work very well and it gives a measurement tool of how you can evaluate that employee quarterly, biannually, annually through the self-evaluation and the goal setting process. Just my two cents. That is what we do at the police department. There is a self-evaluation form as well. Same thing. That's exactly how we handle it there. 
And that's, that's essentially the same process by which we use at the university system as well. So, I mean, we'd be adopting a model that's well established, gives the supervisee plenty of opportunity to provide input and the opportunity for the supervisor to, to go through that input with the, with the employee to make sure that everybody is on the same page. This avoids long-term um, supervisory problems that could escalate into something that is really difficult for the town to extricate itself from. You know, in terms of no one ever told me that I wasn't doing well, what the heck are you telling me that I'm suddenly not satisfactory? You know, this, this allows that to happen on a regular basis and it's documented. So if there's a, an ongoing performance problem, you don't wait till it's a problem for it to be addressed. You kind of talk about it ahead of time. Okay. Well, it sounds like um, there's a lot of support for that. And um, maybe by our next board meeting, we can have um, like a draft process and maybe, um, you know, at least um, discuss what might appear on a form if there's going to be a standardized form or, you know, what questions might we, we ask and whether or not it's going to be like a quarterly or biennial you know, kind of a review or periodic check-in that's, you know, required and documented. Um, Bill, would it be helpful if I sent you our forms, the self-evaluation forms and the actual evaluator score sheet yeah. as well? That would, that would be good. I was also going to throw uh, Scott under the bus too and see if he could, um, you know, throw in his process as well. Um, and between the two of them, I think we could probably nail it, I would think. Okay. I know that yes, I, will. I, will, I will get the uh, okay. documents from Health Trust and pass them along. Okay. Thanks. And, and just, I don't know if you caught that, but um, Highway does their evaluations as well. Annually. Yep. Annually. Okay. So let's uh, try to at least standardize it and agree on a, a process for the all the supervisors. So, all right. Very good. Um, I, I have a question. Uh, it, what's the procedure if, if a select board person wants to do a tour of one of the departments? Just, I, well, actually that was like very much encouraged when I, when I became a select board member. Yeah. Um, just go ahead and call them up. You know, they're open anytime, just make, make a date and time and, and go visit um, every department. You know, that's a great idea. And I know, you know, Steve opens, opens it up. You take a, a tour of the whole place. And I have done a tour with the police department. What's that? Yeah, I, I'd I, love to do one. I've been real hesitant because of COVID for the past year, but yeah. it feels like maybe we're, maybe we're coming out of that and the departments would be comfortable. I, I don't know, Steve, you're the... Well, we're all vaccinated at the PD, so... You know, if you come on in, we're mad. the pressure off. <laughs> right? So if you want to, absolutely. I mean, you know, we're, we're just, you know, especially if you're coming in, you know, one or two of you at a time, absolutely. You know, we can accommodate that. Um, you know, if you came in, at, you know, as a group, it might be a little bit tighter. You know, we could be more difficult to socially distant, but one or two of you at a time, absolutely can accommodate that. No problem. Hmm. And I encourage it. You should, you should need to know, you need to know what all the buildings look like. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And it gives you an, uh, an actual uh, opportunity to meet some of the employees you don't ever get to see either. Yep. See them at the barbecue. That's pretty much it. Yep. yep. I've seen the dungeon. I wouldn't want to be there. <laughs> <laughs> I know that Steve was really good about giving uh, members of the advisory budget committee the tour. Anytime, just say when. All right. That goes for all the departments too. Highways, yep. fire. All right. Well, we've got nine minutes to kill. Who's the gentleman that's coming down the corner? I think that's um, he's on the agenda. I believe. I think that's. Um, pardon me. Yeah, I think so. Um, it's up to him. So I, I have a question. Um, I, 
I wrote that letter in the Laconia Daily Sun, and I sent one to the uh, Record Enterprise uh, to inform people about the election coming up. And I signed it, my name, select board member. Is is that okay? Uh, yeah, because what you, you're just uh, informing people about a process that you know we, we as a board agreed to, which is you know hold that vote. You yeah. Know, we're just uh, encouraging people to, to show up to uh, a board process, you know? So, yep. Um, if you were to, you know, say you support Article 2, um, then that might be, uh, you know, kind of like electioneering. But to, uh, is it? Because it doesn't, it, doesn't it say in the warrant that, uh, that the select board endorses this article? Okay, you might. I don't know if it's splitting hairs or not, but I mean, I would agree with you, maybe on a like a state legislature article, but Are yeah. There any warrant articles that we don't support? The recommendation by the town attorney was not to have um, individuals sign their name to something that they put in the paper as a position being held from the town. So you as a selectman, Neil, if you wanted to put that in there and not sign selectman as we recommend, you know, I recommend you pass article two. As a resident. As a resident, you can do that. But as a selectman, you should not be doing that. It's called electioneering if you do it as a group or if you do it as an individual with a title. That makes sense, Zach? Well, yeah, it's good no, to it, it, clarify. It, it would it would make sense to me if we didn't explicitly have a statement on warrant articles that said that we, the select board endorsed them. I mean, we've already had a public position that says we do. Right. Yeah. So there's a perception, though. Mm. You know, I I mean, unless you feel know, very, very, um, you know, a, a really strong feeling that you had to do that. Um, you could probably do it legally, but there's a perception thing where, you know, someone's going to take offense about this board member who came out in favor of this. And, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's a judgment call and you'd probably win. I mean, there's nothing to be won. It's just, um, just a perception thing, I guess. Well, you know, uh, my intention is to be up front above board, uh, you know, open with people. Right. And what if you didn't actually personally agree with, the warrant article, you voted an A or you didn't vote for it. Well, if you were yeah. not doing the statement of the, that was the board supported, um, if you were negating that or, or saying no to, you know, vote no, even though the board supports, then that's- Right, that's right. That, would, that would feel pretty cut and dry as electioneering. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I look at both. I mean, why risk it? Well, it's good to get it out in the open and, and clarify the issue. And it's good to remind people to vote, Neil. Um, on a related note, uh, on the topic of writing to our, our state representatives, uh, that certainly, as presented in the, in the agenda item, was talking about board members. Is that true for town employees as well? What was that again? Number in terms of, of uh, writing to our, our representatives, so. Oh yeah. Um, does that apply yeah, to town employees as well? Yeah. So yeah, for you, instance. Theor theoretically, we're the executive committee of, you know, of the town and therefore a message from the town to a legislator should be coming through our approval as a board. Uh, so yeah, a, a town member can't, show support one way or the other to a particular bill um, as, and state that they are, um, I'm this, this, you know, I am this person working at the town hall and I support this bill. You, you shouldn't do that. You can't do that. That's, you know, so it's, um, unless it's like a, a, an approval of the, of the select board, then fine. We can, show support in some manner or another, either by, you know, we can state that one person shall, you know, go to a legislator and say, you support this bill. And we can do that of Kathy as well. 
or the board um, as a board or a single person on the board, but going out on your own uh, outside of discussion at a board, you know, you can't do that. I'm probably like overstating that, but. Um, yeah, well, I, I mean, that certainly has occurred. So that's why I was asking. Yeah, that feels funny with a town employee not allowing them. Because I think a lot of times they're going to say, you know, as a, as a town employee, I've seen X, Y, and Z firsthand, you know, or in my experience, as opposed to the executive it can, board. It can be interpreted that they're speaking for the town in that, uh, in that message. Right. And they're actually only speaking for themselves. Well, I can tell you that I just recently did it myself and I was speaking on behalf of law enforcement, but clearly at the bottom of my email address is my signature and who I work for. Um, you know, but I was also weighing in on my perspective as a law enforcement officer more than anything else, more than just a town employee. Yeah, so what happens in that particular case? I think it's a slippery slope. Yeah. yeah. 